this. First thing, or not lambda gun, this <laughs> type theory. Totally different thing. Uh, so, first thing, not an expert. Uh, this was like the Derek slide. If Derek were here, I'd be like, I'm really, really sorry, Derek. I don't know as much as you. <laughs> but not an expert, but an enthusiast. Yeah. So I've been I've been like teaching myself this over the last couple of years, or the last like year ish, on and off. And this is basically what I wish like someone had told me when I started studying it. So it's not usually formal. It's not usually hardcore, but it's a lot of the ideas just kind of like plainly spelled out. Uh, I guess the other thing is uh, a lot of people are, have asked me like, what what use is type theory? Which is silly to you know, justify what the use of something is in a math talk. But uh, I think it, it's useful if you want to get your computers to do logic with you. So if you want your computers to understand the logic you're doing or if you want the computers to help with your logic, this is really useful for anything that's more than basic stuff. Classical logic really fails when you, when you try to get computers to work with it. Because classical logic is all just like this, like there's a, huge, there's a huge useless portion of it that's like very good with computers. And then anytime you want to do anything slightly interesting, it's always just like professors being like, well, you know, then induction, so whatever. And then there's, you know, it doesn't really get into it. And the computer's like, what's induction? <laughs> anyway. well, what's the issue with induction? Induction, well, is it just because it's a this is a, that would be a really, yes, yeah. and this would be a good thing to, to meet up at the end of the show, because it's, it'll, it'll just distract yeah. from this. I want, I want everyone to forget all the classical logic stuff right now. <laughs> so, yeah. yes. So, the first thing that I discovered when I was learning type theory is that there's no one axiomization of type there's no one canonical type theory. There are a bunch of different floating type theories that are floating around in the world, just like there are different conceptions of arithmetic. So some arithmetic you have one, two, three, four, some arithmetic you have zero, one, two, three, four, you know, like you use zero, some you use negative numbers, sometimes you add you know, fractions, sometimes you have Roman numerals. Like, and there are all arithmetic in a very real sense. But there, there's not, when you talk about arithmetic, you're not talking about one like canonical arithmetic. You're talking about the ideas behind it. And I think type theory is much more of a thing like that. Does that sound good to people? Okay, so if you're ever reading up on this yourself, this is usually good to know. <laughs> because one, get, one guy's paper will be like, it's like this, and another guy's paper will be like, it's basically like this, but totally different. And then, you know, you're just crying. Uh, so Are you saying there's like an isomorphism between any two? Well, not even an isomorphism, or? because, you know, there's no isomorphism between Zero, one, two, three, four. Like adding zero, one, two, three, four, and uh, like you know the fractional numbers. A adding those fractional numbers. It's just the same idea. You're applying it in different ways, different things. Is that? Uh, and when I say there's no isomorphism, someone who actually knows math would probably hit me over the head with that. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'm pretty sure. It's not important. But but you get the uh, the idea is what I'm trying to say. Like it's not. It's good not to get hung up over the details of these papers. They're talking. It, it's the ideas that matter, and the, uh, the implementation of them is what it, it threw me off a lot when I was trying to learn this. Okay, so anyone who's done any actual programming here, like for a job or anything like that, excellent. So if you've done like Java or C sharp or anything like that, you might be thinking like, oh, well, the year from last year, so this is kind of silly. But like, you'll be thinking like, oh, maybe the type system is like the type system of those languages I like or don't like, and. The best analogy I can work in with, you know, type theory is like arithmetic. The Java type system is like the language with one, one, two, and many. It's not, it's like only in the most superficial sense is it like type theory. I mean, there, there is a little bit of overlap, but it's not useful or correct. <laughs> okay, so. Did you draw that? No, I did not. That is from XKCD. Yeah. Uh, this is actually like not a true thing either. But that's an entirely separate. <laughs> I looked it up to see if it like I was saying something wrong. And apparently, this is not like this is just a math legend. It's not a real thing. Uh, so there are three things, three ideas that you know I need to kind of build for myself when I was learning type theory, and I'm just gonna 
go over them right now. So the first idea is you have collections of things. You can have collections of numbers, you can have collections of other collections, collections of dogs, whatever you want. No, that sounds like sets. No, it's not sets. We're not, I did not, <laughs> collections is a very <laughs> novel <laughs> <novel. laughs> hmm? So it's, it's, it's piles of things. Whatever. It, it can be whatever you want as long as it's not ambiguous. Then you have some kind of idea of machines. Machines can be things that, uh, oops, that can run computations. When I said this was going to be basic, I was not lying. <laughs> you know, you can have something that takes in three, spit, you know, multiplies it by two, spits out six. You can have a machine that put, takes a dog, puts a hat on the dog. <laughs> you know, you can, <laughs> you can have a machine that takes something and spits the same thing out. And it's a really stupid machine, but it doesn't matter. All that, what's important here is that you crank the machine and then it finishes. Like these machines that don't finish are lame. And I'm sure people with more computer science will know or like why I'm saying that. But as long as you agree in principle that machines don't have, uh, that machines have to stop to be useful, that they always have to stop, then you're then you're fine. Now, if you put a if you put a cat <laughs> in a machine that puts a hat on a dog, does the machine break or? I I don't know. And then if it's a uh, Machine that puts hats on dogs, or machine that puts hats on. What I'm getting mean is like when you when you say you have <laughs> collections of machines, the machines are so you're saying recognize what kind of input they're supposed to get. Uh, so we we can define uh, we can define what types of inputs and what types of outputs a machine is supposed to do, and we're going to talk about that later. And that's actually anticipating this. But this, these are deterministic machines. Too. Yes, they deterministic machines. Determinist machine. That dog always stuff. comes out with that. Yeah. Is this is the stuff? Is that whole thing? Does it? Yeah, we're at a whole like lower level of like, hey, they don't stop. Okay. But are we those can those worry. Similar concepts. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you're a computer science person, you want like determining if a machine halts or not is like usually complicated mm -hmm. and basically in the general case impossible. That's great, but we're not using like we're these are machines you built yourself. So we're saying we're just assuming that. Well, we're not asserting, we're saying we're building them ourselves, so I know they stop. Oh, okay. So like, you know, if I if I build for you this machine, like I know it stops. It like it doesn't right. do anything. It just like I, I know that's that's it. Okay, and the final thing that you have is you have oh so computation, dogs and hats, or nothing or whatever. As long as it's unambiguous, as long as it finishes. And like you said, as long as it's deterministic. So I guess even then Maybe not. There are lots of different type theories. And I'm sure there are you know, probabilistic type theories that play around with that. Uh, then there are proofs. And proofs have a statement. They use rules of inference to give evidence for that statement. And that's all they are. Your rules of inference can be whatever you want, as long as they're unambiguous. Sound good? Things, machines, groups. Yeah. Uh, well, collections of things, machines, and groups. Uh, so, like I said, this was going to be very basic. So. <laughs> so, what does type theory do? Type theory takes these three separate ideas and it kind of blends them together. It at least gives a lot of overlap. Sometimes not a complete overlap, but it makes it so that when you have things, you can. Well, I'll show you. So, you could have machines that produce other machines, which is just, you know, for someone who does functional programming, this is not gonna, this is gonna be very obvious. <laughs> you know, machines that eat machines. You can also have machines that make proofs, though. So, let's look at the machine that makes a proof. So they have a machine that takes in a natural number, so a number is zero, one, two, three, whatever, and proves that that number is greater than or equal to zero. That proof, it actually like prints out on a piece of paper this. And this would be a proof for that. And if I'm pretty sure all of you could pretty easily figure out how to make a machine to program a computer that would actually do this. So what does that mean? That means if you can prove that that, that, that machine that creates a proof always create 
creates a free extra proof for any specific number, then you've proven it for all natural numbers. So does that, does that sound good to everybody? Yes, no? I mean, you just got your induction back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is more powerful than induction because you don't need, you don't, like, th this is just way more general than induction. Because none of those machines need to rely on the other states of the machine. Like, they can rely on totally different things. I, I used something that was basically induction-like because I wanted a very simple example. Is it really, I mean, you have to prove the machine works? Yes, that's, that's important, but if you can prove that, then you have this proof of the entire thing. Well, that only works for machines that take in numbers as opposed to machines that take in dogs. Well, it depends on how you're formalizing your dogs. So, yeah, so, and then once you've, well, yeah, so once you've proven it for the machine, you don't even need to run the machine. Just knowing that it exists and that you've proven it that it works is good enough. And like axioms, you don't need to assert that, uh, so well, like with your regular axioms, you can assert that machines exist without giving any like actual like code for it. So, you know, if I'm saying Socrates is mortal, like all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, I can assert that there's a machine that takes in a guy and, you know, spits out a proof that he can die. So you're assuming the existence is sort of a proof instead of just... Yeah, so when I make a statement that I assume in a, in a proof, you can think of it as asserting the existence of a machine that I'm not building. So I'm not making this machine that goes out and kills people. I'm asserting that it exists and then I can use it later in my in the rest of my work. So that sounds good? Okay, so we have to do, do collections have to be uh, discrete? Possible? Yeah. You can have, because it seems like induction only works on. Well, then don't think about it in terms of induction. We're at a way, like, way less formal level than that. You know, this machine. Like that proof, which was like a series of statements. Yeah, so that was just a. from one element. My original example was like, is this number within one space of an even number? And that's not an induction proof. Or I guess it could be an induction proof. But, but you know, that's not obviously an induction proof. And you can easily write a program that for every example would, do, would, would make that specific proof. And then that would give you a proof that for all natural numbers, every number is within one space of an even number. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, good. Uh, so the other thing that we want to merge together is the idea of collections of things and proofs. So we can have collections of proofs. So if we have a proof and we have a statement, we can take all the proofs of that statement and put it into a collection. So if you have the statement zero is even, you've got a lot of proofs for that. If you've got the statement one is even, you don't have many proofs. If you've got the statement two is even, again, a lot of proofs. If you've got the statement three is even, not a lot of proofs. If you can show that there's anything in this collection, if you define this collection formally, you can show that there's anything in this collection, you can show that two is even. Or if I can show that there's anything in this collection, I can show that one is even. But hopefully I can. Uh, finally, for anyone who doesn't know types, you might be wondering, what's this have to do with types? Types are just the uh, formal name of collections. So now we're going to start formalizing this a little bit. So going back to our example, where we have a natural number and we have a machine that proves that that natural number is greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, we can write out something like this, right? Where we have, we put in a natural number, like this is how we're describing the machine. Right? We put in a natural number, out comes a proof, of the natural number being greater than or equal to zero. Does that syntax make sense to everybody? Everyone fine with that? Okay. Now, if we think about this a little bit more, though, we have, let's, I'm just going to say I implemented this machine. This is what it does. You put in zero, gives you this proof. That's good. Put in one, still gives you that proof. You put in two, still gives you that original proof. Put in three, still gives you that original proof. So we want our we want our input to actually have meaning in the output. So this doesn't work because for any n we don't want to prove that for some other n this is uh, for any natural number we don't want to prove that for some other natural number this is true. We want to prove that for a specific.
specific natural number, we can get a proof for that specific natural number being true. And this is dependent type theory. So before you put the uh, like the type judgment or whatever on the side, and you had a big N inside the parentheses, does that mean that everything on the right side, the arrow, just includes collections of all proofs that N, like for any natural number? It's just like a collection of all the possible proofs that include all the ends. Yeah, I think it, well, the, the, the notation was ambiguous, it was intentionally oh. ambiguous, but the way I would interpret the what I wrote was that there is just, that it's just giving you a proof that some natural number is greater than or equal to okay. zero, which isn't what we're thinking. Right. And what we want, we have to, we have to formalize it like this, so we, you know, it's a specific natural number is greater than or equal to Yeah, and this is why I was going to reveal collections or types, but I forgot about that earlier. <laughs> uh, now it's out of the pack. Oops. Uh, so, has anyone used Opta before? I installed it and started reading a tutorial, but I didn't. I got distracted quickly and didn't get back to yeah, it. So. it. It has some very unforgiving features. Uh, it only runs in Max, which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. Uh, okay, so we start an object program. So we're going to actually do some proofs here in a computer. And the computer's going to understand them, and that's cool. So we're going to start off, uh, anyone who's programmed before, it's just like it starts off with a module de uh, with a package declaration. And that's not really a big deal. Uh, comments are the double dashes. And in Emacs, if you do control C, control L, it will check to make sure your proofs are correct. So I just made a mistake right there. And if I control C, control L, it's gonna explode. If I fix the mistake, yeah, it'll give you a super helpful uh, error message. <laughs> uh, if I fix the mistake, suddenly there's no error message and everything is pretty again. So let's prove some stuff. Wait, do I need Emacs to the environment? Yeah, there's one good, if you have Windows, there's like a, a package installer that installs all of it, which is wonderful because I, I'm not crazy about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, my first proof, and this is going to be like asininely simple again. So, sorry about that. Or not sorry. Need that. <laughs> uh, so, we started out. So there are a couple different ways of looking like this because types can be statements or they can be collections and proofs can be uh, machines and these machines can be proofs. So there are a bunch of different ways to look at this, but I think the most like coming from a classical logic perspective, you have an axiom A and we're asserting that, so we're asserting that a proof for Apple exists and that's called axiom B. And now we're asserting that a proof called, uh, we're asserting that the proof with the content, you know, if you have an axle, uh, ax sorry, if you have an axiom, bleh, if you have an apple, then that will show up. And that's axiom A then B. And if you have baboons, then there's a catastrophe. And that's axiom B then C. Can you explain the top, the first part of the yeah. assignment? Like this is declaring apple. that apple, that the type apple is the thing we can use. Okay, so you say set, like that means there's a. So set <laughs> is actually a type. Is trying to confuse you. So you can refer to so Apple is any any of the types you've defined up above. Exactly. Uh, when you're defining a new axiom. Yes. Okay. You could have said data Apple, comma balloons, comma catastrophe at the top, and then uh, so and then listed all the axioms underneath. Not quite. Data is a slightly more specialized thing, so that you want to have them uh, separate. So <coughs> for the readability of this, I have them separated. Where there's going to be another, I'm going to go through a different way to like write the same thing out soon, and that might might make it might just answer your question. Uh, so we have a proof here. So this is all obvious for anyone who's ever done anything with you know any kind of logic ever remotely. You know, if you have apples and you have apples implies baboons, and you have baboons, it's going to cause a catastrophe. Then you know that you're going to have a catastrophe. If you have an apple. Yeah, if you have an apple. So axiom A is, is like an existence yes. postulate. Yeah. Okay. Or you could think of it as 
as we're asserting that proof exists for the statement X. So, like, er, er, for the statement apples. So you can think of this like, this is a proof that we're not, like, we're just saying it exists, which is the same thing as an axiom. Axioms is just saying, like, we can assume this is true. This is saying, we can assume this is true, and we're calling the, the proof that, that is axiom A. So it's not asserting these, that, that apple is inhabited or that there exists an apple. It's, it's also saying that. So, so is, is yeah. apple an object, or is it a proposition? It's both. Okay. So that's, that's the kind of mind-bending thing where those, uh, where those different ideas kind of merge together. So here we have a proof of family use. And all it does is it takes axiom A and B, it shoves axiom A into it. So A goes into apple, and you get nodes. And you can do that again for finding that there's going to be a catastrophe by taking axiom A and B. And then you can even reference your other proof and just shove that in. Do you hand wrote those proofs then? Yes, the, these, are, these are handcrafted proofs. <laughs> And you could you could also write it like this. Okay. But so when you have um, proof of B colon balloon and then equal like what's the what's the two things there like? Oh, so that's like a proof of B balloon just means the proof of B is in the like yeah it's an example of a proof so it's a like an element of the type of okay I see. yeah it's it's kind of it's weird to think about these separate. These things are commonly conceived as separate as like one, as you know, kind of different facets of like one or two things. But then when you kind of get used to it, it sort of clicks a little. You can so let's say let's say we didn't have the second axiom. Okay. This would not work. So we can't actually without this axiom we couldn't actually create a proof of B, and we couldn't also create a proof of C. So there would be nothing. There would be no way to prove that. There would be nothing that we could do. To Well, yeah, so the axiom of it right now, it only exists if you can give it a value. And I mean, everything lost its, its color, even like axiom A apple. Well, that's because it's Emacs. Okay. <laughs> if you want to look at the red under it, that's the part of that. So this is pretty concrete. Like, can we take this and do this more generally? And you can. So this is that same kind of logic in a more uh, general way. And I did this out like this, so you can see, uh, so you can see some of this pattern matching action. So this is saying for any any type x, for any type y, for any type z, if you have x. to this x variable, this x then y corresponds to this x then y variable, and this y then z corresponds to this y then z variable. And then now that you have all these variables, you can shove them all in together, just like we did before, and we can get a proof. So this is this statement is like tautology. Uh, tautology. It's just true in the abstract. So the to the right of proof, Bobby, is the first is like the intuitive like syllogism description, but then after the equal sign, that's like the lambda calculus because it's in the opposite order. So right here, so you could think of this as either the type or the statement it's, that's, that it's demonstrating. These are just variable def definitions down here. Yeah. And then this would be the proof itself. And does, that, does that sound fine to everybody? Yeah. yeah. And now you can even plug in the axioms from up top to create a new proof. What we just proved already, but you know you can do it again using this uh, using this thing because this is a, this is not only a proof. This is also like a function or a machine. It takes in these things. It takes in a, it takes in an x. It takes in a machine that goes from x to y. It takes in a machine that goes from y to z, and it chains them together. It churns them all out, and then you get the you know you get the obvious implication. And uh, yeah, if you click on this and Click uh, Control C, Control D. Oh, and then you have to. Least, you'll get that you've proven catastrophe. So is this good?
good so far? asserting its existence. Okay. It, it, we haven't built it. We haven't built our murder machine yet. Uh, so that's wrong. The correct way to do it is like this.
this argument's a thing, but this argument's like this concept or this other higher level rule that applies to all the other arguments. Yes. It's not a real argument you pass in. It's just the. So we could force it. it. We could we could change the syntax here a little. If we take out this uh, this. Why don't, I, why don't I just clean this up? A like in Haskell, they have a separate symbol to represent well, so the. So it, the it's, a, it's a curry it's function, right? And first, you pass in a type, which yeah. is required to be a subtype of set. And then you pass in an element of that type that it returns. Not a subtype, more like an element. Right. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm just going to undo all the, act, the pretty syntax right now. exact same thing, though, without the pretty act of us. Why does it work when you part of the, <coughs> part of the bottom line? Or does it, it didn't. It, was, it had a very quick run under one. Oh. Or it, no, sorry. It's the same thing, but you have to pass in more stuff. Okay. So, Ozzy can figure out that when you're talking about x right here, you're talking about a man. Mm -hmm. So it can backfill this parameter. Okay. So if you want to make something like superficially readable, you could make that the input. You want to explain to people, you might want to make it not implicit so you guys can figure out what's going on. So, this is the exact same thing conceptually. So, it's taking the parameter, so it's taking a type and then it's taking a member of that type and then it's producing its form. Something of the type is form. So, right here, this constructor or this axiom or this assumption or takes in a man and produces an example of that man being a woman. So this, so this man fills in this parameter. X is a type man, so that's cool. And then X, uh, and then X is just the other, X is just the specific man you're talking about. So this isn't defining the machine, this is defining the specification for this machine. Does that make sense? Or have I just talked like into a more confusing place? <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so then we'll then we'll modify our proof for Socrates' model to accommodate this new extra parameter of type. So Socrates. If you put a dog here, you oh, put back the type in front. Put in is already a man. No, it would it would it would do the dog version of his model. Yes. Oh. Okay. So you could do that. So if you put a dog in the the dog type, do you, do you want me to do that right now? Do you want yeah, to put a dog yeah. type which fits back now? What, what's a, what's a good dog name? Right. Also do this thing where oh that's not important let's not deal with that right now. One of the 
things that I found make, that made Okta confusing when I started up was that Okta, uh, uh, it like a lot of it is to make it pretty, to make it look like math, but the math is just slightly different than actual math. Mm -hmm. It's can, can be kind of confusing. <laughs> some uh, good resources. 